As we acknowledge the land this morning, let's begin just by grounding ourselves where we are. I invite you to pause for a moment, take a breath, and to feel your, yourself anchored wherever you are. And shifting our attention from the weight of our bodies resting on this land, we can also notice the land itself and how it's supporting us. We recognize that this land has been home to indigenous peoples for many thousands of years. They lived and thrived here long before European settlers arrived and changed their lives and the life of the land itself. Some of us with more time on our hands lately, we might reflect on some of the ways that we've perpetuated racism against indigenous peoples, individually and collectively. Still today, many indigenous peoples do not even have access to clean waters. And as we are being recently reminded, racism remains a serious problem in this land. And those of us born into privilege, we have an opportunity, arguably a responsibility, to educate ourselves and to live actively anti-racist lives. The light of Christ is a fierce beacon of peace, and Jesus calls us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed. And so today, we light the Christ candle as a reminder of our responsibility to this peace. And we are being called to live in active and engaged peace. And that peace invites us to live more than just welcome, to make sure that when you hear the invitation to be part of this community that is different from each other, that there's room for that to show up. We're a community that doesn't think the same, vote the same, or love the same, but today the colors of this rainbow, they call us to expand and to make room for what love looks like. We do that as followers of Jesus who made way to risk for love. And so wherever you are, may you know that you are welcome and we are working hard for stories and voices to be heard that in the past weren't. But on this day, we celebrate that this community lives into more than welcome. And this is a work in progress and you're part of that work. May it be so. Oh 
justice meet. Hear the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ a feast that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the wood and stone to heal and strengthen, serve and teach and live the of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Good morning, Islington families. It's Michelle here, and happy Pride Sunday. Today I have our friendly Pride Bear, and we are here to tell you that no matter who you love or how you identify, you will be safe, valued, heard, and loved. Today we would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to join us for a godly play session at 12 o'clock, followed by our virtual Pride Parade. And we invite you to wear something fun, something unique, and something that showcases who you are. You can email me at michelle at islingtonunited.org in order to receive the Zoom link. We look forward to seeing you very soon. And remember, you are so loved. We'll see you soon. Please join me as we pray together. Constant friend, because people of every sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity have the right to live with dignity and without persecution or discrimination, we remember in our prayers LGBTQ plus people of Chechnya, Uganda, Zambia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and elsewhere who have been murdered and tortured because of who they are. We remember them and the people who love them. We remember LGBTQ plus refugees from around the world seeking safety and sanctuary. We remember them and the people who welcome them. Trans and gender diverse peoples of Canada, the United States, Brazil, and elsewhere who are targeted victims of hate crimes and assaults. We remember them and the people who love them. LGBTQ plus people whose dignity and self-esteem have been eroded by hateful systems and structures. We remember them and we seek to be people who love more fully. Individually, we each uniquely reflect your glory and express your love. But anti-gay violence, homophobia, and transphobia have blocked many 
from recognizing your beauty in all people. All of creation suffers from the effects of such hate, fear, and violence. Daily may we dedicate ourselves to building bridges of love and hope where harmful divisions have been made, making equity and equality for all people our goal, while working continually for justice so that everyone can live fully in your love. Amen. We light our memorial lights and our pride lights this morning for those who have taught us and showed us the spectrum of love and all of it encompassed in God's unending love. open your scriptures and turn to the middle of the Bible, you'll find the Psalms. And one of the Psalms that can feel like a homecoming is Psalm 139. Oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. Oh, 
And if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O oh God, that I know very well. God sees and knows and welcomes the whole spectrum of who we are. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. And so before Maya explores Paul in her reflection, we're going to kind of contextualize Paul a little bit through this teaching. So there are 27 books in the New Testament, and about half of them are either attributed to Paul or about Paul, 13 letters plus the book of Acts. Paul and Jesus were contemporaries, Jesus from a small town, Nazareth, and Paul from a big trade city, Tarsus. Both were working within Judaism. Paul's letters are written to Christian communities who have already known Jesus, a small few or some dozen. Reading Paul is like reading someone else's mail. The letters deal mostly with local matters in these communities, and the letters don't make sense unless we know the local context. Paul's letters, for example, have been used to support slavery, to condemn homosexual behavior, and to subordinate women. These texts can be very hard to understand when read on their own, and they're best understood when read together in a series or in a Bible study. In the New Testament, we meet four different Pauls. Most scholars agree that Paul wrote Romans, 
First and Second Corinthians, First Thessalonians, Galatians, Philippians, and Philemon by himself. They're the oldest witness to Christianity written down way before the Gospels, and they show the most radical Paul. First and Second Timothy and Titus are known as the pastoral letters, attributed to Paul, written by others, and in them you see Paul more as a reactionary. Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians continue to be under dispute by scholars, and they show Paul as the most conservative. As time goes on, Paul's views have been shifted by the leaders of the church community from radical, then to Romanized, and then to normalized. Another interesting thing is that when Paul talks about his suffering throughout his letters, most scholars agree that Paul suffered from malaria, a chronic and painful condition commonly found in the area where he was born. And what's key to know in Saul's conversion and renaming as Paul is that on the road to Damascus, he had a life-changing and sustaining experience of the risen Christ. He's best known as a Jewish Christ mystic. He had an ecstatic experience of Jesus. He felt it in his very cells, and he then invited others to follow Jesus. He embodied life in Christ and Christ in him, and his sense of time was living and working as if Christ would return shortly. Many of his letters suggested it could be any day. Lastly, Paul had a very clear mission strategy. He went only to cities, and he was connecting with urban, working-class people. Imagine 150,000 people living in a city, about 117 people per acre. For perspective, we could connect it to Manhattan, who has, which has about 100 people per acre. And in Paul's time, there were no high-rises. People spent most of their time outdoors, working, and cities were places of misery, danger, fear, and hatred. Paul's mission was not to convert Jews, but the Gentile adherents who already adhered to Jewish monotheism. He introduced these God-fearers or God-worshippers to Christian Judaism, and the rest is history. Let us pray. God, thank you for the ways that scholars have opened our minds to hear story afresh. Thank you for the ways that characters who have passed on for us words of wisdom and words for struggle speak to us again today. On this Sunday, we lean into looking for your wisdom between the words that are said and the words that are heard. May your wisdom be known. Amen. Paul. He has some of the best one-liners in the scriptures. Let us run with endurance the race of faith that is set before us. You shall shine like the stars in the universe. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The past is gone. And now you are part of the body of Christ. Pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except that which is useful for building others up. You may have words of Paul memorized and not even connect them to his story. And some of our tradition of passing the peace is rooted in the beginning of his letters that all begin with similar greetings. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Jesus. This familiar phrase used by Paul, Jesus Christ is Lord, is a term that's prevalent in our hymns and in our tradition. Paul uses it as a way to counter the fact that in his time, the Emperor Caesar is known as the Son of God. For the Roman Empire, violence and power are the keys to victory, and they move us to peace when all is quiet and orderly. But Paul counters this Roman imperial theology with a radical view that Jesus' way of nonviolence 
leads to justice through equity, not punishment. Paul teaches that peace on earth will prevail when all the members of God's world receive a fair and equitable share of its bounty, when all of God's family have enough. As church communities formed and the return of Jesus was not imminent, rules and agreements of how people would live and behave together were put into place as conflicts and differences of opinion emerged. What began as a movement became over time an institution with much history and many different interpretations of how Paul was encouraging people to live out the mission of the church. Hindsight is 2020, especially in history. And we can see where we Christians got this mission wrong. The Crusades, slavery only abolished for 150 years, the indigenous residential schools experience, treatment of women, and treatment of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, and queer peoples and the ways we care for the earth. We seek forgiveness as Christians for how our ancestors and how still in this time scripture is being interpreted, how we've acted on this understanding of what it means to share the good news. And as we move forward, Paul offers a helpful phrase and underlining theology. Paul often speaks of Christ crucified. This phrase does not mean substitutionary atonement as expressed in John 3.16. It doesn't mean that God sent Jesus as a substitute for our sin, to die in our place like the temple sacrifices given to please God or subdue God's wrath in that time. For Paul, it is the resurrection that gives meaning to the cross. Christ was murdered by the Roman Empire. They killed Jesus. He was executed, and then in the resurrection, he was vindicated by God. As Paul said in his letter to the Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? The cross also reveals God's character. God has immense love and passion for the world. I want to put another image in your head this morning besides Jesus as a sacrificial lamb, a protester speaking out for justice, a firefighter running into a burning building to save a family, a parent risking their life to save their child. All of these people choose to risk death so others might live, to sacrifice your life for another is out of love, not substitution. These people are heroes, not martyrs. They die because of love or concern or care, because it matters. If you love someone, you would die in their place so they might live. If you love someone, you give anything so the world could be more just and fair. Jesus risked for love, for the love of God's people and the promise of God's peace. As I speak these words to you today, or watching different ways that people are standing up for love, for life, for change. Frontline workers risking to care for others in shelters, in long-term care homes, in hospitals. Others choosing to stay home because those they love are immunocompromised. Protesters acting for change to systems that oppress and that cause suffering. People trying to do what's right despite the risk. What's even more radical in the teachings of Paul on this Pride Sunday is the notion that everyone is worthy of God's love. Everyone. This gives me pause to stop and wonder as I was examining my own feelings towards leaders whose policies are harmful, towards neighbors making choices I might not agree with, other situations that have seemed over and over to be unfair or unsafe. 
the Christian story is for everyone. No one is outside of redemption. And it begs the question, would I die for someone who I don't think is worth it? Would you? Are these words of Paul that all are redeemable? Are they true in God's eyes? Christ crucified is life in Christ. It's about dying to an old identity and way of life and rising to a new identity and way of life. It's a metaphor for radical internal change. Thus Saul goes from Saul to Paul. This happens in Christ through the power of the Spirit. This image is hopeful. There's hope that we can have an identity transplant a spirit transplant, that a people can change, that the church can change, that we no longer need to hold to the wisdom of this world. We can stand against it as Jesus did, as Paul learned to, and as the early church struggled to. The last image I wanna leave you with is a reminder that much of Paul's work was not merely for the conversion of individuals. It was always to create communities, communities who broke bread and remembered, who ate a full meal together where no one went hungry and then shared the cup as a sign of this new covenant, new life in Christ for all. In our hymn book, there's a fitting hymn called The Church is Wherever. The first two verses, the church is wherever God's people are praising, singing God's goodness for joy on this day. The church is wherever disciples of Jesus remember his story and walk in his way. The church is wherever God's people are helping, caring for neighbors in sickness and need. The church is wherever God's people are sharing the words of the Bible, in gift and in deed. But the most powerful verses of that hymn have been left out of our hymn book, verses that are more fitting to Paul's experience of Christ and the early church's commitment to each other. We'll sing them today, but hear them now. The church is wherever God's people are loving, where all are forgiven and start once again, where all are accepted, whatever their background whatever their past, and whatever their pain. The church is wherever God's people are praising, knowing we're wanted and loved by our Lord. The church is, was, the church is where we as Christ's followers are trying to live and to share out the good news of God. On this Pride Sunday, let's sing this anthem of inclusivity now. and 
So we come to this table. The Holy One be with you and also with you. Open your hearts to the one who is love. We open our hearts to you, O God. Let us give thanks to God, our Creator, for the courage of the Holy that lives in us. We give thanks. Bold and beloved one, throughout history, you have revealed yourself to us in ways that surprise and disrupt. You shocked the world when you came to be with us as a vulnerable babe, born into a family, fleeing political persecution. And through the scandal of your embodiment in Jesus, led to the crucifixion, still your spirit of new life is birthed among the marginalized. You live among us today, O God, in the lives of black trans women whose experiences of violence are dismissed and ignored, among bisexual people living with HIV and AIDS, as babies born into the care of lesbian women. You wander school halls as trans children and navigate the streets as queer couples walking hand in hand. You come to us as LGBTQIA+, and two-spirit youth with no home. You are embodied by two-spirit people still fighting against the impacts of colonization, erasure, and stolen land. At times, O oh God, we are offended by your self-expression. You take on flesh in people and places and ideas we've been taught to fear or despise. And so we struggle our hearts harden, and our hospitality recoils. But still, your love persists through beauty and compassion and truth. You lure us into laying down our need to control. You move us, you free us, you embrace us. By your grace, we're brought into the sacred labors of justice and transformation, and we become free in Christ to reject all evil and oppression. And like those who gathered with Jesus on the night before his arrest, we come to this table in need of grace. And after feasting with his companions, Jesus took the bread, as he had so many times before, and he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to them. He said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this, remember me. And then he took a cup, as he had so many times before, and he poured it. He blessed it. He shared it. He said, this is the symbol of the new covenant a new way of being. Every time you drink it, remember me. And in remembering the life of Jesus, we remember that he showed us the love of God is public. The love of God is intentional. The love of God is explicit.
Spirit of God is with us and in the taste of these gifts. And so we pray. And in the sharing of this meal, wherever we are in our homes and with ever we share, whoever we share the meal with, pour out your Spirit, O oh God, on this bread and this cup. And through these gifts, open our hearts to encounters with Christ. May the bread of life and the cup of blessing strengthen us in our courage to live the welcome that Jesus lived. For this is not the table of Islington United Church. This is not the table of the United Church of Canada. This is the table of Jesus Christ where all are welcome and no one is turned away. Amen.
Let us pray. Nourishing one, your gifts renew us in body, spirit, and mind. Through this taste of love, may the Spirit send us with a faith that is brave. Let no institution or narrow thinking hold us back. Make us people who boldly pursue collective justice and tend gently to the world's pain. We do this in the name of Jesus who taught his followers to pray. And we sing those words together now. Since its beginning, the church was meant to be a place of chosen family, a community of outcasts and outlaws, dreamers, prophets, and humble disciples of love. In the company of divine presence, we create belonging and nurture justice with gratitude for the sacred labors of love in this place. On this Pride Sunday, let us bring our offerings to God and one another.
David, as you were singing, I was picturing the day two years ago when Islington United voted to become an official affirming congregation, that overflowing of pews and people who are here to draw that circle even wider. We do that knowing even now when we can't stand exactly side by side, that we do that with our acts of service and generosity and every offering moment that you support the work of this church is connected to the wider church and its work for mission and service in the world, but it's also connected to the work that continues here to provide more than welcome in this time. Let's offer our offering prayer together now. Holy One, receive our offerings and transform them into compassion for others, into community for the lonely, and hope for the church and the world. Amen. Join us after the service for a time of passing the peace and sharing good news. Join us in the midst of the work that's going on through the website at islingtonunited.org. Stay tuned for the new ways that the words of welcome and good news will be shared in this time. We are grateful that you're part of this community as we learn together to be more than welcome. Let's sing our departing song, Now There Is No Male or Female, words from Paul's own text.
Go from this place to be the you God created you to be. Go from this place following in the way of the Christ who risked for love. And may you find the Spirit offering you courage and hope in this day and always. Go in peace. Amen.